Hello, and welcome to uh, DebtNet at IETF 110 online. I'm Lou Berger. We have uh, with us uh, Janos Farkas and our secretary, uh, Ethan Grossman. Uh, this is our second session, and the information is um, posted, as was uh, <laughs> as we talked about um, yesterday. Uh, this is an ITF meeting. I think you all know that, and uh, I most are familiar with the rules that govern our uh, participation and our process. If you're not, please um, uh, go look up the note well. Um, everything we say here it becomes part of our public record, and it is being recorded. Uh, we're using Meet Echo. Um, you're here with me, so of course you know that. And uh, Meet Echo automatically handles our blue sheets, and um, it does have a chat channel. The, the Jabber is still there um, if you want to go directly into that. Um, note taking, you've seen in chat, we're using Code EMD. Please jump in and help us uh, take notes and capture what is said. That's particularly important if you make a comment, um, whether it's in Jabber or in um, at the mic. Uh, I'd like to have that captured. Uh, comments that are said in Jabber will be repeated um, in general. Uh, if for some reason you don't want it repeated, that's fine, but then don't add that to the minutes. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, the tools page seems to be having a little bit of trouble, so uh, you might want to go to Data Tracker. I'll point out that the Data Tracker now has the HTML, the tools format HTML, which uh, personally works much better for me, so you may wish to go there. We're in our second session. Um, we have a joint session on Friday with um, that's being hosted by PALS. It's joint with MPLS and Spring, and it's really focused on um, the MPLS label stack and um, uh, pseudo wire related control word and OAM and how those things are going to progress. And there's lots of lots of um, uh, work going on in that area. So if you're interested in that topic, I suggest you join. The uh, agenda has not changed since it was posted. Um, we do have uh, a reasonable amount of time for each slot. I'm going to try to go a little short, so it'll leave even extra time for more discussion. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, um, we've added a new step to our ITR disclosure process. Specifically, if you join a, as a contributor or as a co-author, um, to a working group document, we ask that you uh, make an IPR statement at that time. Uh, we reviewed the status of our drafts yesterday, so I'm not going to redo that today. Um, if there's any questions, you know, feel free to come on up to the mic or put it in chat. Um, oh, uh, I should mention this, uh, being asked for working group adoption, this OEM framework dra draft is the first one that's going to be presented, and um, so please pay attention. And uh, we still no news on IETF 111. So with that, we're going to um, jump right in to OEM. Greg, just please make sure to say yes. next. <laughs> okay, ready. Okay, thank you, um, and um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so um, we've been working um, on a document addressing the comments and discussion that we had since uh, previous uh, 109 meeting, and um, the structure is the same. Uh, what was uh, updated is that uh, we added the requirement section that previously was uh, part of a working group adopted document on OEM over MPLS uh, data plane. And um, it um, included their section that discusses the use of hybrid uh, OEM measurement methods that was part of uh, OEM document uh, in IP. Uh, next. So uh, originally uh, we used uh, their document that was um, 
spawned from um, raw OEM support. And we discussed it uh, in 109. We received updates. And uh, that uh, reflects what we've done. Um, I already mentioned that. No questions. OK, we can go to the next slide. Um, so what is a hybrid OEM? Um, RFC 7799 uh, identifies, uh, defines active and passive. So the active uh, uses the specifically constructed test packets uh, to perform measurements. And passive is that it doesn't have any uh, visible um, impact on the network. And one of the example of the passive would be uh, SNMP uh, or probably um, uh, net cons notification. Um, there are different methods that uh, pass been classified uh, as passive. One of them is uh, uh, in a group of on path telemetry uh, collection, IOM, an alternate marking method. Um, so the telemetry uh, information can be, uh, the process can be separated into two uh, um, sub-processes. One is a trigger and originated, and the second is a collect and transport uh, for the network analytics. Um, IOM tracing uh, uses two methods. Um, that characterizes end-to-end -end and half by half. Uh, in addition, um, for IOM tracing is defined uh, direct export, which is every node that originates uh, telemetry information exported to the collector separately. And uh, another um, mode of collecting transporting was pr is proposed and uh, discussed in IPPM working group uh, it's a hybrid two-step. Uh, it is uh, using the follow-up packet that follows the same path as a trigger packet using the same encapsulation and collects uh, telemetry. Uh, why we think it's important to discuss it? Because especially for the NetNet, uh, where the network resources dedicated to that net service are um, scarce and precious, um, they're method of collecting and transporting on path telemetry is important because as you see for IEM tracing uh, it you, it embeds uh, the telemetry information into data packet itself into trigger packet whereas uh, direct export and hybrid two-step uh, can be transported out of band even if there uh, follows the same path but uh, using different class of service uh, in the network for the hybrid two step or being sent uh, out of band in terms of the death net uh, using direct export. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, another important part that, uh, of the update to this draft um, is the list of the requirements. I didn't call, we didn't copy the list itself, uh, so uh, there are more uh, requirements. We would try to summarize that will fit in one um, slide. So uh, I don't want to read them. You can look it up and uh, as part of their um, meeting materials, um, the slides are there. So what we emphasize is that each and every node in DeathNet must uh, be uh, capable of acting as a um, source or addressee of OEM session, so act as a, a map. Um, the second one, um, that's where we have uh, some discussion uh, among offers and uh, really appreciate uh, your consideration and suggestion. So whether it's uh, a should or a must, the DeathNet OEM session uh, originated from the uh, central controller.
Uh, obviously, that's important, their uh, network failure detection and uh, ITF mechanisms uh, that could be used, the protocols uh, among them are BFD and ping and trace route. Uh, in-band uh, requirement. Um, often um, there is a, some misunderstanding or misconception that active OEM is not necessarily in-band. Um, by sharing the same uh, encapsulation of their uh, flow that is being monitored, active OEM uh, is um, in-band. And so thus, uh, we're able to do interpretation of their um, failure detection or performance metric collected and uh, apply it uh, to the network analytics. Uh, another requirement is that uh, OEM must support one-way measurement, whether it's a one-sided or two-sided. And uh, in case of uh, two-sided, so the uh, results can be collected out of band. Path MTU discovery is important. So as uh, packet replication, uh, duplicate elimination, and uh, order preservation function. And because this is a very um, deadnet specific, it's something that uh, we are planning to take uh, charge and uh, have a proposal uh, probably by the next meeting. And the protection switchover. So that's something that needs to be discussed in terms of whether it's an end-to-end -end protection or it's a local protection. And the next slide. That this. Um uh, this slide and this section of the document typically to get a lot of attention as we do adoption. And I'll just remind people that they can make their uh, comment on the list and say they wanted to address this part of the working group process. It doesn't have to block adoption just because you disagree with one of these uh, points. But it is right. good to uh, express your view during adoption. Thank you. Uh, what I wanted to stress is because um, now, working group documents uh, such as um, DEFNET OEM in MPLS um, with MPLS data plane and another document with IP data plane, uh, they uh, reference uh, the requirements and now they reference uh, this document. So we, uh, by moving this, um, list of document to its more logical place in an OEM framework in a DEFNET uh, created a dependency. So it's a really much appreciated consideration of adopting this working, uh, this work by their uh, DEFNET working group and then uh, progressing it further. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Greg. And um, I, I like uh, the approach, uh, actually. And as you said, now the, the, this would be an OEM framework, a definite OEM framework, and uh, to which uh, the MPLS OEM and the IP OEM could refer to. This one would, uh, would uh, specify the common aspects uh, for that OEM. Thank you. Comments? Anyone want to come into line? We have a minute or two. Uh, I think it's really useful to get um, any objections to adopting this document. Now, normally, if we were in person, we would do our usual poll, but it's a little hard um, on Meet Echo. But getting objections is not. Um, uh, so, uh, please if, go ahead. If, if, if I may, um, I, I don't know if uh, definite. Um, uses this uh, hands tool that is in Mitico. 
I'd like to just um, ask people if they have objections, because um, uh, if we if we uh, do the tool and ask for objections, we don't know what the objection is. So I, I, I really I think we'd prefer to hear what the objection uh -huh. is, whether that someone types it um, in Jabber or says it at a mic. I, I think those are good. Now, of course, we are going to do this on the list, so there's always an opportunity there. Personally, I actually have some technical comments on the document, but I don't think it blocks adoption. Um, so I'll make those comments during the adoption call, and we'll address them during work, normal working group processing. Uh, but if someone has a, an objection, particularly a strong one, it would be great to hear, hear from them. All right, well, uh, uh, thank you very much for this work. And uh, we should expect to see an adoption call on the list and um, hopefully get some good comments. Uh, moving to next, I think we have control plane. Bring that up. Dirk, are you presenting? Are you out there? Yes, I'm here. Sorry. Uh, yeah, please, uh, please go ahead and just say <laughs> next. Just, uh, I was just waiting for the slides to show. Um, yeah, if you go to the next one, please. Yeah, thanks. That's uh, an update to the. Uh, we presented the first version of this in the uh, in the 109 and in the interims meeting in in December. Uh, <clears throat> we had discussions, uh, in particular, in the interims meeting on what we intend to, you know, the focus of the draft to be, uh, and and I highlighted the keywords. Here that are copied from the um, from, from 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 the abstract, uh, which means we are proposing changes to RSP and SERF um, with, with, for a better alignment with RS uh, with TSN. We called it RSVP um, dash TSN in the document, uh, and that means we we are limiting the scope of the draft to uh, to those changes. Um, we had a bit of discussion in the interim on whether or not this 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 would have a broader scope to something like RSVP .NET, which we initially planned. But we kind of focused this down to the TSN part um, initially, but that doesn't limit us to maybe go for uh, uh, an accompanying exercise for um, uh, you know other changes to RSVP. But we wanted to start with that. Go to the next draft, please. Uh, next slide, please. Um, at the end or as you go? So uh, next slide, please. Have you changed the slide? I can't see an update. It's the same slide. Same slide for me too. Uh, now it's the next slide. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think you, you, you yeah, you jumped the you jumped the um the structure slide. I think there was a slide in between. Um though. Uh, Oh no, that's 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 the one. Yeah, thanks. Can you hear so, me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can. Oh, I, I, I had I had audio problems. I must have had a connection problem there for a moment. I'm, I apologize. Okay. Um, uh, thanks. No, no, yeah. we're on the right one. We're on the right one. We're on. We're okay. On the right one. Um, one one question is: Do you want um, comments as we go, or do you want comments at end? Oh uh, yeah, that was the question. I didn't really quite get. Uh, I'm fine. I'm fine either way. Um, I, 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 I heard something about end, but uh, that was, must have been when you had audio problems. Uh, yeah, OK. Uh, let's just take it at the end. <laughs> Keep going, please. Sorry. OK. Thanks. <clears throat> so we, we, we clarified the use cases as a change from the last version. We now present two use cases with a, what we call a hybrid .NET over TSN aware customer network. Uh, the difference is um, that we have, uh, in, in one case, a, uh, a, a core network with RSVP support, and the other ones uh, we don't. That's um, the difference in the use cases. Um, section three uh, is, is now focused on the design rationale, which are the former sections two, 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 three, two, five. So we merged them into a new section. Um, and then uh, uh, focus section four on the RSVP uh, TSN uh, uh, proposal, which uh, took the layer into actions revised from the previous version. So it's, it's, it's a revised part, but it's largely taken from, from, from uh, the previous draft. 
And we also changed the API descriptions to align with um, the terminology, which was uh, another um, comment we received. So in the structure, if you go to the next slide, please. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> so section two is uh, are the use cases. Um, also there, we revised and learned the uh, terminology as a, a request. Um, design rationale, section three, as I mentioned before. Uh, and then uh, uh, section four is, 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 the, is the proposed design, which, which has the layer interaction, uh, the, the interactions, the, the API descriptions, uh, and the message formats will come in the next version. We didn't finish them in time for the deadline. Um, so that's the, the last subsection of uh, section four. I don't know why the numbers went wrong. That's obviously not section seven there, but never mind. That's at the end. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. So the we received feedback both in the in the in the uh, one and nine, but also the intermediate meeting here that we tried to address in the new version. So the the scenario was uh, uh, the one uh, what type of scenario you had. That's why we revised the use case section uh, um, to provide there hopefully a clearer example. Um, we clarified the relation to the to the TSN specific data plane drafts by providing revised API descriptions um, in section four. Um, also clarified the use of the flow information model by aligning the terminology in those API descriptions again. And also did a scrub, um, hope that we caught most of the things where we had misalignments um, across the sections where we were diverging from the terminology. Thanks, uh, next one please. So the next steps uh, I'd like to do is to fill in the message formats and the protocol information uh, as I didn't, didn't get that done in time. Um, and obviously, uh, uh, would like to seek more input from the list, uh, with potential, which brings me to the last slide, if you can just jump to that one already, uh, um, which means we would like to hear feedback, comments, um, potentially uh, anybody who's happy to help us, co-authors and contributions are very welcome. Thanks. I think I got notification of David Black in the queue. Yeah, um, if, if you saw the uh, presentation on the Yang uh, on Monday, does this draft intend to cover all of the data plane scenarios that were outlined in that Yang presentation? Um, no, we haven't. We haven't reviewed that yet. I, I noticed that yesterday. I sent a note to my co-authors as well to to have a good look at that. Um, they, they 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 couldn't make it to the meeting, um, so can't tell you. Totally. Okay, let me suggest that the, 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 the presentation material did a really nice job on covering all the various uh, data mm -hmm. planes uh, that would work. It would be great if RSVP covered all of those. And as part of that, could I suggest you find an acronym other than TSM, which is going to, going to create some bad uh, implications about which data planes this applies to. Okay, thanks. Fair point, yeah. The um, I'd like to follow up on that comment, even though I'm, I'm Q jumping in the blue. Uh, the the document is really is focused on inner working of a DetNet RSVP with TSN. Um, so uh, unlike David, I think your your the title is appropriate because you really are limited there. Um, but I'd, I'm going to go back to a comment that I believe we made at the last couple times that you've talked about this draft is we don't have a definition of what RSVP looks like for DetNet in general. Um, and that's for the, all the use cases that David just talked about, where for IP, um, for MPLS, for aggregation. We don't know what that looks like. And there's, there's a, a, a large body of work we can build on, in particular, the traffic engineering extensions to RSVP. And I note that you're not building on those, you're building on InServe. So, mm -hmm. you know, wh what's your thought about addressing these base capabilities um, uh, it, it, from the comment before, from David's comment, as well as from uh, previous meetings? Yeah, so when we discussed how to, how to move forward, uh, because the comment, as you, uh, as you said, was made during the last meeting, uh, uh, to go for an RCP DeadNet, we found the, the actual, at least for us, for the, for the authors that we had, too large, so we honed it down to TSN, but I do agree, and that was the discussion we had in the last meeting, that there's a whole body of work to be done on 
a dead net view on RSVP, if you, if, if you will. But it's probably that we didn't want to tag that on. So hence we hung ourselves down into DSN, but it's a little bit kind of avoiding the work. But um, I think it's maybe also starting the work. So we wanted to be concrete uh, from the from the TSN angle and can then maybe reopen, you know, that body of work or that discussion once, you know, we move forward, if you will. Right. So that was mm -hmm. that was a little bit our compromise in a way. Okay. Well, with um uh, sort of chair hat on. My perspective is follow David Black's guidance. Mm -hmm. um, Balaj, you're in queue. Uh, yes, so this is also what I wanted to highlight. So I, I think thank you very much for the update. Uh, based on that, it is much more clear what was your focus with this draft. Um, and uh, I, I would like to join the previous comments that um, the, the title might be misleading because what you are focusing here is uh, if RSVP is used for that net signaling and you are using graph for TSN signaling, how this control plane signaling uh, can interact in a net subnetwork scenario. So I, I think that is your use case and this is uh, pretty well described in the updated uh, draft. So thanks for that. Uh, but I think also that uh, this is something that must be highlighted in the title as well that you have a special focus on a special scenario and not solving the uh, control plane signaling for that net. Yeah, that's, that's, that, that, that's a fair point. We left the, we left the um, title of the draft there, which probably wasn't the best thing to do instead of reflecting the actual focus in the draft. Um, so that one I do agree with. As I said, um, I mean, there is an interest to come back. I mean, I discussed this with, the, with my um, co-authors to to look at you know the larger problem still of control plane signaling um uh, you know uh, but it would be i, I see there's a body of work that probably goes beyond um the competences that we the three of us have uh, and that's why we, in the meantime we would probably like to just stick to it and we can just re reflect that by narrowing also the scope clearly in the title and renaming the title but certainly being interested in addressing the uh, can rope a signaling problem at some point as contributors. Okay. Uh, David? The obvious question. If the draft scope is limited to uh, if RSVP is used for DetNet, then this is how it works with TSN. Um, do, do the folks involved have running code for RSVP insert for DetNet? Sorry, I didn't. I didn't catch the question. I had an audio issue. Uh, have yeah. implementation, even prototype, of RSVP int serve for DeadNet. I think your draft is assuming this works, and that's an interesting assumption. Um, yes. Sorry, I, I again had a hiccup, uh, drop out somewhere. But I, what I said from the question is yes. Um, that's that's what we do. Okay, but do do you have running code for RSVP for for RSVP int serve for DetNet? Let me check that with my co-authors. Yeah, I'd, I'd advise checking it because I think the the question's lurking in here is mm -hmm. it is a very convenient assumption, uh, and it would be nice if it were true that RSVP mm -hmm. int serve can work for DetNet. Um, that really ought to be ought, ought to be sanity checked somehow. Yeah, thanks. That's fine. Uh, Janos is in queue, so I'm guessing he's coming as a contributor. Please, Janos. Yes, I have uh, a similar concern, like uh, the previous speaker said that uh, sort of uh, the basis would be to figure out how RSVP works for that net, that net on its own. And then we can think of integration with TSN and without having the basic stuff. Uh, it's, it's hard to see uh, or hard to do the work, I think. I understand you want to narrow your focus, but uh, still, the debate, I'm afraid. Yeah, I think Giannis and I are about the same page. Um, not, cl not clear that RSVP int serve for, uh, uh, for DetNet is the proverbial right thing to do, although I do understand the, the concern about massive, massive expansion of scope of your work. I 
think we're running out of time, um, so we'll, we'll uh, move on. Um, I, I do think if you are looking at this work and expanding it or looking at make sure you have a good foundation, it is important to look at the TE varieties of RSVP. I think you'll find that they bring a lot to the table. Um, I, would second, I would second Lou's comment because right now the only active work on and use of RSVP is TE, not, not in surf. And with that, we're going to move on to uh, Microburst. Yuzhong Peng, um, if you would uh, come to the mic, <laughs> I find your slides. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Um, just make sure to say next when you're ready for the next slide. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, this is a uh, talk about uh, microburst, and I'm Dong Feng Du from. China Mobile. Uh, and next, please. Uh, it's, it's the second version, and uh, we get some uh, feedback and uh, make some mo modifications. Uh, first, we change the statement that uh, the large scale SP network is not in scope, and uh, it's because uh, uh, the net is scope for single administrative, uh, administrative domain which could be uh, small or large. And uh, we also change the status to the informational uh, because uh, our key issue is not an implementation of a queuing mechanism, uh, but is a new uh, explanation, uh, exploration uh, to provide this low latency service. And uh, we uh, add some explanation about the motivation and uh, the way to decrease the uh, microburst. Uh, several new sections are added. Next, please. Mm. One Next. comment about, uh, I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, uh, one comment okay. on, on the slide. You say DetNet is scoped to single administrative domain. Um, it also can support a closed group of administrative control. So it, it could, um, include um, cooperating administrative domains. So I think you, your, your comment there that sub bullet is not aligned with our charter. So just be aware of that. Uh, okay, uh, I'll correct it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this page about uh, uh, what we want to know in this draft. Uh, in our opinion, uh, the Currently, the TSM mechanism are too complicated to deploy in large-scale SP networks. Uh, we have uh, analysis many uh, problems. Um, and, uh, the conclusion, uh, our, our conclusion is that nowadays, uh, we are short of a common and a simple method to, to provide this low latency service in large-scale SP networks. Uh, and, uh, uh, our method mentioned in the draft show a potential solution that is both simple and uh, scalable. Uh, meanwhile, it does not need uh, type stack recognition. Uh, we think that perhaps it can benefit some low latency service providing uh, in uh, large scale SP networks. Uh, next page, please. Uh, this page about the uh, 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 mechanism in our uh, draft, uh, we have several preconditions. Uh, the first one is that uh, critical traffic in the network should have a uh, higher uh, priority. And the second is that uh, have enough bandwidth reserved uh, so that there should be enough bandwidth for them on the interface. Uh, so we think that they should know uh, both in the uh, network. And uh, in this case, the main problem is to decrease the microburst. Uh, in our mechanism, uh, we, we, we do this uh, flow shipping on the edge. And uh, on the intermediate nodes, we do the per interface aggregated shipping. Uh, we change the regular behavior on the router. Uh, 
it is to say that uh, uh, the router forwarding all the traffic as soon as possible. Uh, in our mechanism, we uh, use uh, the shipping method in the TSN so that uh, the traffic will be forward uh, in an ordered way. Uh, next page, please. Uh, we also give some uh, analysis of, about the proposed method. Uh, when we compare comparing into the traditional IP forwarding uh, with the priority in a relative light loaded network, uh, our mechanism can offer a better forwarding for the low, low latency traffic uh, with less microburst. And uh, of course, we have some cost, uh, the cost of shipping on the on the edge and uh, keeping the shipping result on the intermediate nodes. Uh, comparing the TSM mechanism, uh, our mechanism is uh, 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 simpler and uh, more scalable. Uh, of course, we have some disadvantage. Uh, it's about the uncertainty. If we think that in our mechanism, uh, uncertainty perhaps is higher. Um, but uh, uh, okay, when the uncertainty is higher, perhaps some of the net use cases cannot be supported in our mechanism. Uh, next page, please. Uh, uh, this page is about uh, the work at the uh, next step. We are trying to find whether some of the uh, .NET use cases can be supported in certain conditions. Uh, we think that, for example, uh, in a network that uh, the critical traffic is not too much, or the low latency traffic is not that critical. Uh, and perhaps at the, at the first step, the low latency traffic uh, not that critical would, be, would appear in the uh, large scale SP network first. And uh, we also think about uh, to do this uh, to, uh, approximate uh, evaluation of the uncertainty. Uh, we, we need to check whether the mechanism we can work can work for those low latency traffic that are not, not that critical. And uh, we think that uh, the packet uh, replication and uh, elimination method in uh, TSN can help because uh, uh, in our mechanism, perhaps we cannot ensure that 100% uh, lose this. Uh, this uh, packet replication and uh, elimination perhaps help to grab some uh, packets that are uh, uh, lost in the network. And uh, th this is the last page, I, I think. Uh, uh, if if uh, if you you have any problem in, any question, you can talk now. Thank you. Thank you. David, can you go ahead? Yeah, so looking at the description of this, uh, the approach looks a lot like DiffServe, where uh, the flows are individually policed at the edge, and then there's a uh, flow aggregate uh, traffic, traffic conditioning, conditioning in the core. Um, the scalability comments are definitely on the mark, because that, that was one of the reasons that DiffServe was designed the way it is. I'd encourage uh, the authors to take a look at uh, DiffServe framework. Uh, that'd be uh, RFC uh, 2475 uh, is the place to start. Thank you. Uh, I will. Uh, any other questions, comments? Yeah, personally, I think this is interesting work, and we look forward to you know seeing how it uh, evolves. I don't know if there's any other comments. If there's not, we're going to move on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think Yako is up next. I think so as well. Uh, how's my audio? It's OK. Please okay. go ahead. Just say next okay. when you're ready. I understand that that's what has to be done. 
Maybe one day Miteko will have a button for us to push to move someone else's slides. Hi, everyone. Yaakov Stein. Uh, it's nice to be back in the IETF after uh, a long time. Next. Next slide, please. Um, the reason I haven't been coming to the IETF for a long time is I've been wasting my time with uh, 5G x hall transport. Uh, and I really could use this time to plug a, a book which just came out, but I won't do so. Um, there are problems having to do with delays, I'm sure you all know, uh, when doing uh, backhaul of mobile, and it's gotten much worse in 5G. Uh, and people have uh, thought that perhaps TSN or DeathNet mechanisms are, uh, can be adapted to uh, solve this problem. And it turns out it doesn't work very well. Uh, in particular, I'm talking about QBV, which I realize is not a DeathNet, it's more of a TSN approach, but I have to define my first line here. Uh, the mechanism I'm talking about is for what I call a time-sensitive packet flow, where I mean by time-sensitive simply that uh, the packets have to be delivered within um, only a little bit more than the physically possible minimal time uh, to get through the network. And when you try to use mechanisms that do time gating, uh, it turns out that they don't scale. And if you actually try to give an upper bound, the upper bound is much higher uh, than what is physical po physically possible. And if you don't plan it correctly, and it's almost impossible to plan it correctly, the efficiency on the line goes down. Um, and we're wondering if there is a mechanism that doesn't suffer from all of these problems. Um, and it's interesting, by the way, that the 802.1 people themselves, the TSN people, uh, in their CM document for XOL, um, recommend frame preemption, but don't recommend their own mechanism uh, for, for this, this case. And uh, which I think is basically because it doesn't scale very well. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, just before I introduce what I want to talk about, I just want to um, give a uh, model for the forwarder, which from now on I'll call router, although it could be a switch, an SDN switch, uh, an MPLS, LSR, whatever you want. Uh, but basically, I'm talking about a forwarding device which has two parts. Forwarding logic, which uh, takes the packet and decides which output port it has to go to. Uh, and scheduling logic, which decides which packet of all those packets uh, that have to be transmitted over the output port uh, should be first. Uh, and I just want to mention that when you think about it in terms of segment routing and TSN or DeathNet, rather than saying which port and which packet to send over that port, you can think of it as where to send a packet and when to send a packet. In other words, forwarding is basically saying, Given this packet, it just arrived, where should I send it? And scheduling says, when should I send it? And when means something when you have your uh, network elements all synced up to a common clock. Next, please. So what am I proposing? I'm proposing an alternative uh, to using QBV and similar mechanisms that relies on using a stack data structure uh, added to the packet, in the packet headers. I'll mention in a moment what has to be in that stack. Uh, there are two options. Um, one is only for the scheduling problem, one's one for the, both for the forwarding and the scheduling problem. Uh, and the nice thing about this alternative is that it can be optimized uh, in a scalable way. Uh, it can, its configuration can be um, adapted. In other words, you can add a new flow without having to uh, start touching a lot of network elements, a lot of routers in the network, uh, during which time you'll have inconsistencies and, uh, and you might have uh, uh, packets go to, uh, uh, either be lost or fail to meet their deadlines. Um, and it uh, can get down to very, very close to the physical delay. And um, the uh, mechanism using a stack it has sort of an analogy with segment routing. Uh, I spoke about this yesterday in spring, and there some people said it's not really met in segment routing. Uh, however, I want to uh, uh, claim uh, that it's a kind of, it's, it's uh, analogous to segment routing. And we'll see why in a moment. Next slide, please. Okay, so to explain to you why I need a stack, let's talk about two 
known ways to reduce end-to-end -end propagation delay without doing gating and things of that sort. One is called longest in system, in which you insert into a packet its birth time, that is the time either it leaves the host or enters the network, and you prioritize packets based on the birth time. Earlier packets get sent first, but obviously this is suboptimal because a packet which has been a long time in the system but doesn't have a very tight budget would be prioritized uh, over a packet which actually is almost has its budget used up, but it hasn't been that long in the system. So you might decide, let's use what's called earliest deadline first, or EDF, and that simply puts the packet's deadline, the absolute time that it's supposed to reach the other end of the network or the final host. Um, and that sounds better. It is better. However, uh, that obviously prioritizes packets with an earlier final dead time, uh, deadline in each router along the way uh, without knowing how far it is from this router to the final uh, destination. So uh, you might have a case where you are prioritizing a packet which is, just has one more hop to go over another packet which, has, um, uh, which looks like it has more time but actually has a, long, a, a large number of routers to yet to traverse. So both LIS and EDF and many other variations where you put one time into the packet aren't good enough. Next slide, please. So the idea is to put a stack of deadlines. When I say a stack, I simply mean a list where you see the top of stack and you pop it each time. And that uh, stack element has the absolute time that the packet should leave the present router. So e for each router you traverse, uh, you pop the top of the stack, you look at that time, and you do some kind of scheduling, which might be EDF or just in time or something I call PEDF, look at the draft, uh, or, uh, or any other mechanism. And of course, you need some mechanism for figuring out these deadlines. I'm going to show you one in the next slide, which I mentioned in the draft, but certainly not uh, the only mechanism. And I refer to other ones in the draft as well. Three minutes. Uh, Okay, um, of course, this requires something more complex in the router than a simple FIFO queue per QoS, like is normally done in a router or a switch. However, I think it's less complex than using time sensitive gates, time scheduling gates. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and why do I say it is analogous to segment routing? Because if I'm already putting a stack, uh, which has an entry for every router to be traversed into the packet, I might as well uh, combine it with segment routing and have both the forwarding decisions and the scheduling decisions in the same stack. In other words, I, put a, I can put a stack in where every entry in the stack has two sub-entries, one a forwarding sub-entry, basically where do you send the packet, and one a scheduling sub-entry, which says when to send the packet. Uh, so when you do this, you pop the, the each router pops the top of stack and knows both where to send and when to send the packet. Um, this can be combined uh, with best effort tra uh, traffic with strict priority, and you can even have several priorities uh, of time-sensitive packets. Next slide, please. Here's a simple example to give you the idea. Uh, why these numbers are what they are, you can see in the draft. However, the idea is the host, in this case, I'm do, using it like in segment routing rather than like in sort routing, uh, source uh, routing. So you actually see the header which is being inserted uh, only after the first router, and it has the number of entries as the number of routers minus one. But basically, you will see the stack there, the SRTSN stack, if you're doing both where you have both the forwarding sub-entry and the scheduling sub-entry. And each time one is popped until you get to the final one. And you can even save a bit uh, by uh, having a special code for, for bottom of stack rather than wasting a bit. But that's, we don't really have to go into that right now. Next slide, please. I realize I only have one minute. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about how much room this takes. If you're thinking of uh, 128 bit IPv6 addresses and 64 bit timestamps, this would sound like it would take a tremendous amount of room, but not so. You can actually make do with much, many fewer bits. Um, actually, I even give you one extra bit here because if you do that trick I mentioned before about the bottom of stack, you don't need that plus one at the end. 
but you actually, in many cases, uh, for the kinds of networks where this is important, where you have several hundred routers and the maximum amount of time that a packet can go through the network um, is uh, on the order of milliseconds, this can end up being 16 bits or maybe 32 bits if you're really uh, going to squander them, which means that between four and eight hops only require as much room as a single IPv6 address. Next slide, please. And to sum up, what I'm asking from this working group, and I asked something similar to this spring working group, uh, and I was going to ask PCE as well, uh, but they didn't get me into their schedule, is where should this work be done? It is similar. It has elements of segment routing. It has elements of time sensitivity uh, of the DetNet variety. And of course, it requires an optimization algorithm. And uh, by the way, uh, it was interesting to hear just before about RSVP. I also have a non-centralized mechanism where you don't have to do measurement of the li link delays ahead of time, but rather send an RSVP-like packet uh, ahead of actually several of them and measure the, the and acquire uh, timestamps and sort of measure the delays as you go. But simply, I'm asking for the chairs uh, to coordinate where uh, and if they want this work to progress. And of course, if there's interest uh, in this work at all. That's it. OK, uh, we didn't, you didn't leave time for questions, because uh, we do have one more slot, and we're rapidly running out of time. Uh, we'll take the action to coordinate, so absolutely. And it seems like there's some interest, because we've, we've got good discussion on the list, which is always nice to see on a new draft. With that, we're going to move to the last presenter. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, by the way, thank you, Yako, for uh, showing back up. <laughs> Hello, could you hear me? Uh, we hear you just fine, and your slides are up. Um, so please proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Joanna speaking. Uh, I'm going to introduce the problem statement about queuing magnesium with multiple cyclic buffer. I have submitted the draft. Uh, next, please. The previous experts uh, has introduced the method of guarantee deterministic uh, services from different angles. Uh, the, this draft uh, focus on the queuing mechanism of cyclic queue and forwarding to guarantee the end-to-end -end bounded latency. The uh, bounded latency draft uh, already uh, have already described the requirement about it. Uh, for a given that night clients of services, uh, they are a site of two or more buffers provided under the output key layer. Next, please. The IEEE 802.1 QSH uh, has defined the two buffer self key, uh, two buffer per output uh, as the finger and the le left finger shoe. Uh, all nodes keep the same cycle starting time. Uh, the packets sent by upstream node and circle X must be received by node B under the same cycle. Uh, in a cycle X, uh, node A send all packets in the buffer to node B. In the same cycle X, node B use a buffer to accumulate all packets from A. At the same time, the node B sends out the packet that have already been buffered in cycle X minus one. In the next cycle, X plus one, the node B will send, will send out all the packet that are received from node A in cycle X. Therefore, if the packet Traverse um, uh, H, pop, H hops, the maximum latency is uh, H plus one times uh, TC. Uh, what, is, uh, what is TC? TC is the 
buffer of a cycle. Uh, and the, the minimum latency is, uh, H, is uh, H minus one times Tc. The jit bounded is uh, two times Tc. Uh, as the gray square, uh, it's uh, the, dead, the, the dead time in circle X. Uh, which is used to identify different cycle. The link um, propagation delay should be observed by a cycle. Next, please. The problem statement, um, statement of two buffer CQF uh, uh, is presented. Uh, the three point disadvantage. Uh, first, the dead time waste bandwidth results. Uh, for example, the dead, uh, the dead time is the gray square, is the sum, um, sum of link delay, output delay, preemptive delay, ampersion delay, and the processing delay. Um, this buffer cannot be used to send pancakes with the deterministic services. So this mechanism uh, prohibits the deployment with long link uh, because the, the link propagation delay must be smaller than TC. So if the TC, if the TC, if the link pro, pro uh, if the link is longer, the TC is bigger, the bounded latency is bigger, and the jitter is also higher. The last advantage is that uh, the node B will receive the the, the last pancake in uh, cycle in cycle X from node A, and uh, also receive the first pancake from cycle X uh, X plus one from node A. So the cycle ambiguity easily occur. Uh, because of the variation in link delay and the output delay. Next, please. So, a key mechanism with multiple cyclic buffer is proposed. Uh, the data light bounded latency describes the requirement for CQF with more buffer. The multi cyclic queue and the forwarding paper also recommended to support long link and good latency and bandwidth utilization. So this way, decouple the link propagation delay and the TC, uh, for example, without sacrifice the bandwidth utilization, TC can be used with arbitrary link length and the number of buffer can be flexible site. Mm, to, uh, to solve the problem of cycle ambiguity, a cycle label can be put in pancake. Uh, this label identifies uh, which cycle the pancake belongs with. Uh, the pancake in different cycle can carry different cycle label. There can be multiple ways to map cycle label in a pancake to local cycle buffer. For example, the node B may receive the pancakes from different up, upstream node that carry different cycle label and put the pancake into the, the local label. So he swamps to the, the upstream label to the local label. Maybe the, there are different mechanisms to achieve them. Next, please. Uh, welcome to review and uh, contribute. Uh, Cotton and co also are uh, also welcome. Thank you. Hello, Chair. Uh, yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, do you have a question? Or, okay. 
Well, uh, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I'm not sure if we see any questions. I see, actually see David is unmuted. David, do you want to make a comment? Yeah, let me see if I can choose my words carefully here. There's been some extensive uh, behind the scenes discussion uh, between myself, uh, the chairs, and uh, with the ADs watching about this draft. The advice I would give to the authors is to split the mechanism away from the location of the bits. And then I think the crucial question of the DetNet Working Group is whether the problem that the authors propose to solve is something that the DetNet Working Group wants to take on, in which case a plausible path forward would be to work on the mechanism here and then go look for the bits elsewhere. And I can think of at least four places where one might be able to find bits. Uh, Torla, thank, thank you. you. How is this, uh, so, so David, how is this different from Yakov's draft with respect to queuing mechanism versus encapsulation? Yes. I'm not sure I want to split that hair. I'll just observe that both those drafts came to DetNet for DetNet to figure out whether the scope of what the group wants to work on includes the problems that Yakov and uh, this draft proposed to solve. Right. So from my perspective, certainly the normative thing that, that, that we require would be an encapsulation for the interoperability, right? And uh, I think that applies both to Yakov and our draft. and. Um, you know, I, I, I can just observe that would be the similar type of, you know, encapsulation that uh, was done in support of uh, pre-off uh, in that Allow right? me to suggest you get the cart and the horse in the right order. If you have a defined mechanism, it then becomes possible to go to find the encaps. And in this, in this particular case, I can think of multiple encaps that will work. Right, and, and the, the, the mechanisms are defined. Um, like TSN, they may not have been defined in uh, the DEAD networking group, but the encapsulations, you know, in the same way as pre-off, right? Where was pre-off defined? Um, and uh, why did DEADNET take on the encapsulation MPLS for it? All right, we have uh, uh, Yaakov in queue, Stir in queue, and I'll point out we're over time. Um, they usually let us run a few minutes over, um, but we will have a hard stop when Meet Echo says um, that we're done. So we'll keep going as long as we can, but just be aware we are over. Uh, Yaakov? I'll be really, really quick. Um, just as a response to uh, uh, what uh, Terva said, um, I am not at this point recommending any particular uh, encapsulation. I'm bringing up a, uh, an issue. I think this issue uh, is a valid one. Uh, it's one of the problems that I mentioned also, that uh, all kinds of gating have this uh, problem that they have to absorb the amount of time between the switches. Um, and I think that the right thing to do is if the mechanism actually can be proven to uh, be efficient, is uh, you'll have to define a, a, either a universal encapsulation, which is in addition to everything, or find a way to stick the bits in and uh, as, uh, uh, was mentioned before, there are several different places you can put it. Stuart? Well, it uh, seems to me that, yeah, yeah sorry. It, it's, it seems to me that this is definitely a problem that DetNet has the largest interest in. It being the the working group that's working on the most critical form of of, um, of uh, you know, time related communications, and so I think it, this is really the place to at least start this piece of work. If we decide that we need to export it to a specialist encapsulation group, then that's fine. But I think this working group is the working group that needs to to own this set of, um, of problems associated with getting packets to the right place in the right time. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll thank point you. out. Uh, I'll point out that to date, we as a working group have only taken on informational documents related to queuing, not standards track, because we're, that's outside our current charter. Uh, and more than that, the transport area typically owns queuing mechanisms. I don't know of any case where a queuing mechanism has been defined in the routing area. Um, 
the definition of that, though, is if uh, is not outside the scope of the IETF, and if the um, ADs and the transport area agree that you know the right place for it to be done is DetNet, um, you know, we'll we'll follow. Uh, but we are being very careful as chairs to stay within our charter and to coordinate with the transport area on the definition of new queuing mechanisms. Referencing existing queuing mechanisms and how they operate with DetNet um, and whether they need special um, bits on the wire, I believe that is in scope. That is within the discussion. It's the queuing part that's not. Um, I'm going to um, uh, go to uh, David out of queue just because um, we might get cut off. And if we're still going, I'll, we'll come back to Torless and Stuart. So David, next. Wearing my transfer area working group hat, as we're likely to be the, one, of the, one of the places uh, where the bit hunting goes on, the expertise on cyclic queuing is very clearly in DebtNet, not in the transport area working group. I'm comfortable going looking for bits if the mechanism is defined here. I'm not comfortable being the primary uh, venue for defining the mechanism. Okay, thank you. I mean, and we can follow up with ADs on that comment. Um, so thank you. Uh, Torlis? Uh, he dropped himself, Stuart. Uh, so I am. Uh, I'm pleased to hear that from David. I, I would have been worried if it had gone to transport and then died, but because I, I think this is really important, and because it's important to us, we need to work on it. Uma. Uh, hi. Uh, so thanks. Uh, thanks, Jeff. So I think uh, my my opinion is basically uh, the problems Statnet has been talking over a period of time uh, with respect to bounded latency and also the jitter case. This draft. Uh, uh, need to be solved in DetNet, and also it's not. Uh, this is uh, like you know, DetNet is more focused on PE to PE case, not to end to end, so to speak. From what TSN the uh, TSV working group is doing, so I think uh, this has to be done in DetNet uh, to the associated problems and use cases that have been discussed for many years here. Okay, uh, um, Stuart, are you still in queue? I assume you're out. And uh, all right, um, well, uh, thank you all for the discussion. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, a big issue with queuing is uh, our charter, and that queuing isn't done in the routing area traditionally in the ITF. Uh, but we'll we'll work to find a home, and uh, so uh, we'll work with the transport area uh, chairs, which includes David, and also with the um, uh, with the area directors who. Um, you know, the ISG says where work goes. So we'll work with them on that. And um, uh, can, I, can I just jump in with a question there, not about the queuing, but, you know, if I observe Yakov's uh, draft, which I find very interesting from the perspective of actually, you know, in contradiction, what some people in Spring thought, I think is an ideal case of exploiting segment routing, whether it's MPLS or V6. Um, we, we haven't, you know, done SR as a forwarding plane in DebtNet. Um, am I the only one that sees that as a gap? Uh, that's a question we've, um, so SR has been raised a few times in the working group. Uh, we've said we're going to coordinate with the SR chairs, and we've been talking with them over the last two or three IETFs. Uh, privately, we've said to them, it's time we have to make a call as to which working group owns this. Um, so uh, we've said to them that we're happy to do it in DebtNet. Uh, uh, but it's also, um, you know, that's their forwarding technology. So we want to coordinate with them, and we'll, we'll let you know which working group they, that work should go to. Yeah, from my experience with multicast and MPLS or so, I think that's an interesting discussion on what to do best to get the best results. So, um, yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, appreciate everyone staying over. We're going to uh, end the meeting now and really appreciate the contribution and look forward to further discussion on the list. Thank you all so much for participating.